Okay. Okay, good afternoon and welcome. Uh, thank you all for joining us for another episode of the Jane Irrigation Training Series. I'm your host, Richard Rastusha, and today we're going to be talking uh, with Michael Derwenko about a water crisis happening in his hometown, a town he grew up into, uh, Tampa, Florida. Um, and it'll be interesting because I suspect that some of the issues that Tampa is facing is also uh, uh, a challenge for a lot of other cities across the U.S. when it comes to water and solutions for uh, needing more water uh, for people in, in, in urban environments. So uh, from that standpoint, I think it's bigger than just Tampa, but uh, but we'll find out. Uh, so it's going to be very interesting to uh, to learn about what Tampa is facing and more importantly, what they're doing to uh, solve it. So uh, Michael Derwenko is um, uh, somebody who you've seen before, I imagine. He's uh, um, he's worked in the irrigation industry since uh, he was 15 years old. He's got great experience as a irrigation contractor. He's worked for manufacturing. Uh, uh, he's run uh, helplines. And as far as just getting really good advice on how to do certain things in irrigation, uh, and specifically for him, uh, most, most recently the past few years, indoor cannabis, Michael's been a go-to in the industry for, uh, for the knowledge that he has about uh, irrigation and indoor in irrigation in particular. So we're really excited uh, to have Michael here with us today to talk about um, the Tampa crisis. Uh, Michael, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, so Michael, uh, help us understand right from the get-go, you know, how, how big of an issue is this uh, in, in Tampa right now? Well, um, it's ironic because I just moved back a couple of years ago and moving back from San Diego and having the issues with water we have out there, um, you know, anything from drought to just water sourcing. Uh, I didn't expect to come back to Tampa and have uh, kind of what's the challenges that Tampa has going on right now. When I left, uh, we had heavy iron content in our reclaimed water and our well water. Um, you know, we weren't really uh, looking at some of the things that we're looking at right now and that are being proposed. And so, like you said, I think this is metaphoric for a lot of issues that are going to be coming up around the around the country. Uh, we're always going to have water challenges, and I think some of these, if they're not popular, will bring some attention to them. Um, and the resources we already dedicate to them, where the, the systems do exist. Yeah, I think it's interesting, right? Because in Southern California, we're dealing with drought. I don't really think of Florida as a place that has drought. I think it rains very regularly there. It is why I'm so happy that our smart controllers measure actual rainfall and then adjust irrigation schedules based on the rainfall. And I always think Florida is a great place to use that. But nevertheless, there's other problems that occur uh, in, in any uh, water delivery uh, area. Yeah, it makes me think of um, the... Uh when they put a res restriction on how many barrels you could buy in Utah uh, to, you know, you're only, you're only privy to, to, to salvage so much rainwater uh, before you, you can't do, do it legally anymore. Um, so, I mean, even in abundance, uh, you're gonna have your water challenges. Uh, we're slapping, you know, meters on agricultural wells across the country to, to meter well water. Um, so, I mean, just because there's an abundance of water doesn't mean you're gonna have potentially displacement issues or, um, you know, toxicity issues. It's a really good point. You know, and the other thing that's, that, that reminds me of this is every time I look at water costs across the country, right, they're very different. You know, we're a family of four in San Diego, where I live, is going to spend 200 a month. Uh, someplace where it doesn't rain very much, Phoenix, Arizona, maybe four or five, six inches a year, uh, they're going to pay 50 bucks a month for a family of four. And then places in the Carolinas, the East Coast, the Northeast, Boston, very expensive there too. So uh, yeah, about water situation is very regional. We see it in a lot of different ways. Yeah, um, you know, it, coming from irrigation, a, a lot of what we use water on is, is not necessarily for primary use, it's uh, for ornamental. Um, and we see how wasteful that can be. So, uh, you know, if we could rope that in, that'll help substantially. But, you know, you've always said that if um, you are, the only way to get people to stop using water is to, to raise prices on water or charge more for it. So I think, um, you know, hopefully we, we can avoid that. So there are solutions, but we're trying to avoid the more costly ones. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, listen, I'm excited to get into it. 
Yeah, so I, I put the title in, um, you know, uh, the crisis because every every form of crisis is different. And as I said, I, I wasn't expecting to move back to Tampa and, and hear so much about this. What we what we've deemed it here in in Tampa is the Pure Water Project. Um, this is uh, something that across the country is going on. There's different ordinances and laws going into place to make sure, uh, you know, that we're doing things uh, as naturally as possible. We're not disrupting estuaries where we don't have to. Uh, we're not adding uh, toxicity levels to places we don't have to. So uh, in Tampa in particular, we have a waterway that a lot of our uh, city is, is it, the, basically the river is cutting right through our city. And in this first slide, as you can see, I put some facts up about it. Um, it's the river snaking through the middle of the image on the, the satellite image on the left um, that ends at the triangular space on the bottom right here. And that triangle is what you see in this image right here. So I'm looking south in this image. So um, we have water that travels 60 miles from a natural watershed full of cypress trees that were logged years ago, um, which doesn't help things because they you know, provide natural filtration. So the, these watersheds, um, we capture some of it. We slow a lot of the water down. We have dams that, to control it. Um, we have a bypass that you can see in this satellite image uh, for times of heavy rain. To make sure that the river doesn't get too high and you know uh, infringe on the floodplains, so uh, there's a combination of water challenges here. We're trying to reroute water more so certain times of the year, less so other times of the year, and then on top of that, um, we also produce our, our, a lot of wastewater that we need to displace and we need to get rid of. Um, so currently, we're putting it in a lot of it into the bay. It's it's minimally treated. Um, but it is affecting the, the Bay Estuary. It's raising temperatures as you'd expect. Um, and ultimately when the tides come in and bring water into the river, uh, it mixes the, uh, the issue, brings the issues literally up river. And you can tell by the wildlife that they're not very excited about it. And so there's a series of challenges there that we title Pure Water Project. And then there's a few solutions that um, some really smart people have provided that it's up to us as a community and city to figure out whether or not we think they're, they're viable solutions. Yeah, so it's really interesting. Uh, you raised a uh, new level of question for me. You know, mostly when I meet people, I'll ask them, uh, you know, do you know where your water comes from? And very few people know that answer. And then uh, how much does your water cost? They don't know that either. And now I've got a new question. Where does your water go after you use it? Uh, because this is a very important question that, uh, that most people just don't know. Yeah, and you know, you know when you're paying $8 or $10 a month for water, um, and your bill is $60, it makes you notice where it's going because um, you're not paying for the, the clean water as much as you're paying to get the old water out and clean it. So um, it, I guess in so many words, it's the same thing, but uh, you're getting billed on the back end basically. And so when you break the bill down and your bill is eight to $10, not like Southern California, um, there's a lot of money going towards the process. And you just wanna make sure that money is going towards the right process and potentially the right solutions. So this next slide, um, like I said, it's deemed pure water project. Uh, this is actually, uh, from what we've read, kind of popular across the country that they deem it a pure water project um, in most instances uh, where there's some, you know, either capacity issues, cleanliness issues, or displacement issues um, because, or the, the horrible term of uh, toilet to tap. Uh, but that is just one, you know, granular aspect of this, uh, this program or this, uh, this report that was was done. Um, the report in particular was the city hired a company called NWRI out of California, and they came back with some challenges that they see that Tampa is going to face over the next 10 to 15 years. Um, some of them are a ticking clock, some of them are more, are more organic. Um, and then they provided some solutions and some budgets for those solutions, which we won't get too far into the budget. But um, as you can imagine, there's some very expensive options out there. Yeah, so uh, it made me study about this too, and this uh, whole concept of pure water projects, right? They exist in a lot of cities across the U.S., including San Diego, where I live. And right now, our goal is to, uh, by 2036, have about a third of our uh, water uh, reclaimed and reused and recycled uh, our, our wastewater. So um, I, I do see this as a moving trend. I actually found that there's over 500 uh, cities across the country that are already doing this. Yeah, and so um, I'm I'm definitely interested in in looking into those more. I know some of the other policymakers in Tampa are as well. 
Um, you know, the solutions that they're that the scientists are providing are here in the bottom right corner. Um, you know, anything from pumping uh, water and recharging aquifers that already exist, uh, adding it back to the river, which is basically upriver before our dam, uh, where we pull water from to treat and drink. Um, whoops, sorry. Uh, sending it to another utility, uh, injecting it deep into the ground, uh, treating it so you can actually drink it, um, or once again, using it for more for healthy river flows as opposed to uh, treating it and drinking from it, but just to make sure uh, we have a spring up river called Sulphur Springs. The aquifer itself is uh, is on the brink of salinity, substantial salinity intrusion, and it's just kind of getting tapped out. We don't need our, we don't want to have a reliance on it for too much longer. Um, and so, what's going to happen is our river flow is slowly going to um, impede, and in doing so, we're going to threaten wildlife and estuaries down the river. So they've talked about taking this barely treated water and putting it back into the river which is obviously um, something that people are concerned about. Yeah, and I guess that's the issue right there, right, is the uh, how, how much it's treated, right? One of the most popular cities in America, Las Vegas, almost all their wastewater is treated, um, treated naturally, a good portion of it is treating that naturally and then commercially pumped back into Lake Mead for reuse. Um, and that that's that's one story, but I, I guess that is the controversy, how much treatment this, uh, this uh, wastewater gets. Exactly. Yeah. And, and how it's, how it's treated and um, how, you know, how, how much, uh, how much you might be doing harm. Um, it makes me think back to uh, a blog you wrote one time about recycled plastics and how many times a Starbucks cup can be recycled. Um, well, we know the same is true with soil. You can only till soil so many times before the nutrients are drained out of it. Um, the same is true with water is um, you can't just keep treating water over and over and over and have this expectation that it's going to have uh, what you need for, uh, for life to thrive around it. Um, so uh, some of the objectives on this, on the Tampa Pure Water uh, side of it, the NWR panel that, you know, produce these things. They, like I said, they want to maintain river flows. Uh, the reason, and you can go down the, the slide and read, but the reason that um, we talked about this yesterday, kind of pre, pre-training webinar was uh, the dynamic of this challenge is really, uh, is really interesting because uh, there's three or four different parts to it. And they're all kind of different sources of water. You have watersheds that are basically spring fed and rain fed. Uh, you have deep water wells that are uh, you know, getting salt in them. And basically we're just tapping out of them. We have natural springs along the river that we're not uh, tapping into enough. Um, you know, and, and then like you said, the, how much can you treat the water and how do you treat the water? That's a, a lot of complex problems and challenges uh, around water in a single city. Um, and in California, you know, the water comes in one way and if we don't use it, you pump it into the ocean or you put it in reservoirs, uh, the, or you want it to rain more. The drought is, I, would, I don't wanna say it's simple, but the dynamic is a little less than what this is in my mind. And that's the complexity and that's why I think it's such a hot button topic here in Tampa is because uh, there's not really any perfect solutions. We could spend a lot of money and raise taxes substantially um, and start using um, very fancy filter systems, but nobody wants to do that. And so we have to come up with solutions um, you know, on a dime. And then some of them actually are based on uh, a date, you know, an actual uh, law in Florida where by 2032, we have to stop pumping anything into into groundwater reservoirs or back into rivers. So we've got to figure out a way to do something with this old water. Um, so Mike, I had a got, question questions. coming in on the previous slide um, from one of our viewers and they're asking uh, who, who decided to use the NWRI panel? Yeah. Um, I would I would have to assume city council signed off on it at one level. Maybe the, the city's office would have brought it up. Um, we're an elected mayor city, so mayor is going to bring up just like she does the budget. She brings it up, council reviews it, opens it for public opinion, and uh, whether or not they um, wanted to choose them, um, I I think it was probably more. Most people just wanted to make sure that it was a third party qualified. Mm -hmm. um, and knowing anyone that lives in Tampa knows the current dynamic of our city council and our mayor, they probably wanted it. They wanted the jury to be as far away as possible on this. So they found experts in California. Um, I would think that things like that played into the decision. 
But you and I both know that um, obviously UF and Michigan State and Minnesota, these are all very acclaimed schools for, for water and water management. So um, the first thing I did was look for the names to see if we knew anyone on there. Um, and I have to imagine that they all collectively came together and f- shared their opinions. That's what it says from the notes. So, Yeah, and I, I know that these water agencies, I know these agencies, and I know they're using about 29% reclaimed water in their, uh, in their areas. So definitely experience them. But I just want to remind everybody, too, I've got the chat and the Q&A open. So if you do have some questions or comments, please put them in there, and I'll get them to Michael. And for our good questions, we always uh, send you some uh, cool uh, Jane gear. Yeah, and so some of the options that came up in the uh, NWRI report for Pure is uh, this is how we could potentially get rid of the wastewater. And so, um, as you mentioned, uh, we could raise PFAS levels and do a lot of things uh, to the water and overly treat it. Uh, these are some of the more, I would say, natural solutions, minus the, the second from bottom, uh, that they've provided. Uh, these are all uh, obviously open in, to interpretation. Everybody has their kind of uh, their different views of how we would do this, what it would cost to do it, and, uh, the infrastructure necessary uh, to use these as solutions. Um, so we're, uh, we're having to play this out right now. And basically, we're at a, at a standstill where... Um, it's either going to, uh, we, we have to get more testing done to see what doesn't happen. We're paying almost a million dollars to just sit around and run tests to see what doesn't happen if we don't do anything. Um, and so that's obviously creating some frustration in the city as well. Um, so recharging a well, uh, I was not very familiar with this. I'm from Texas. I spent a lot of time in California and I did, I grew up in, in Florida putting well, um, hiring subcontracting a, somebody to drill a well I put a pump on the top um, and you know learned wells that way I did not know you could pump water back into the ground uh, to refill aquifers I have to be um, right up front about that uh, I did some research on it and it turns out Tampa is or we're already doing it in the county in two different places um, so it's not it's not new to our systems uh, which it, you're led to believe that it's a horrible way to do it. I mean, you're, you're pu- putting treated water back into an aquifer of clean water and hoping that mother nature mixes it together. And it, by the next time it comes to the surface, uh, it's cleaner than it was when you put it into the ground. Uh, this goes back to the con- contamination levels that we talked about earlier, but the w- message I wanna drive home is that this is not uh, a new science to the area. This is already being done in two different places. And you can also see the recharge rate, which is pretty, uh, pretty ample 14 uh, million gallons per day that's a that's a lot of water going back into the ground so you know by uh, so maybe you'll get into this michael but looking at other ways that we use this uh, treated wastewater does the actual process uh, continue to clean it yeah yeah the idea is it's a cyclical process as the water comes back up over time um, the soil filters it the it, the bedrock, the limestone filters it, and uh, you know, in in fifty years when we need it, or hundred years when we need it, it'll be clean. Um, and the, the, I think the jury's out on it. But at the same time, I, I think the argument is you could store this, you could store it elsewhere instead of injecting it back in the ground. So, Michael, we've got a question coming in, and the question is, how much of what or what percentage of this water treated wastewater is being used for landscape irrigation? Yeah, and so um, so some of the solutions that they don't get into, uh, you know, that's that's a great question because we had um, we have extremely high iron content in our water here, and it stains everything yellow. And uh, you know, you can hook up reclaimed and basically pay a, a yearly fee to to pull as much water as you want within reason. Uh, but people were starting to shy away from it in their landscapes because it was staining um, hardscapes and houses. And so you either redesign the irrigation system to avoid this, you put in drip irrigation, which is a huge um, you know, opportunity for drip. That's how I learned drip irrigation was because we had to keep overspray off of sidewalks, hardscapes and houses. So, um, so I think, it, and then there was fertigation involved with that as well. So you could, you could try to counteract the iron content to, to get the staining down, but the infrastructure on these residential irrigation systems slowly failed. So um, now people are stuck with either putting a new system in and just running it off of the city water, which doesn't help our plight right now. Um, and so I really want to see what we could do to use more reclaimed water out there. Um, but I think a lot of people are shying away from it because the quality of it. So 
one, we either, um, you know, fertigation technology has come a long way in the last 20 years. It's not as brittle as it used to be. Uh, so we potentially subsidize or offer rebates on fertigation. But you're, the question, person that asked the question is right. We should be using more reclaimed water in our systems. But if you saw the reclaimed water and smelled it most of the time, it's not very good water. And I think that's why there's apprehension from the public here to, to trust the government to filter our water before we drink it um, because the reclaimed water is, is not very good. Uh, so I, I do think filling fountains, filling pools, using it for irrigation are some easy solutions to try to use some of the reclaimed water that we can't use right now. Um, but we also get a lot of rain here. And so we're not, in, we're not using a lot of water um, irrigation wise a part of the year as well. So uh, that's when it collects, we have an abundance of water. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting, right? Because um, uh, again, it's the, the, what level do you treat it, right? We all water that we use for landscape irrigation in California is treated to drinking water standard. And uh, that's probably uh, overkill, right? So uh, yeah, getting that level right will be important. Well, a lot of the syst irrigation systems here, the larger users, like in Southern California, you have the polo fields, you have the big uh, HOAs, um, you know, in, in Tampa, we don't really have that kind of level of um, development. I mean, um, to, to some extent, to, to the extent that they have out there. Uh, but what we do have is our apartment complexes typically have reservoirs or retention ponds in the middle of them. The, they're built around it. And then they pull water from that for their irrigation systems. Not as much as they used to uh, because of just filtration issues and same thing, just cleanliness of water. So if those apartment complex were using reclaimed water and using drip irrigation on their turf and on their beds, instead of relying on any overhead, you never even see water running. Imagine how much water, reclaimed water they'd be using um, that we could be getting out of there. So I think a lot of the focus is like, well, we need, 50, we need to get rid of 50 million gallons of reclaimed or treated water a day. Um, and then the, the first thing we think about is putting it back where we got the water from. And I really think, uh, instead of injecting it into the ground, we could have it come into the ground another way, which is through irrigation. I just wanna make sure it, it's the same thing with our recycling program here in Tampa. A lot of the, the biggest people, uh, the biggest customers of waste management aren't even offered recycling programs. So uh, I think mm -hmm. it's, our outreach is getting better. Uh, we mentioned at the beginning, uh, marketing these things, how you market these things to get the public involved because sometimes these topics are boring. So there's a way to market it to get the public involved. Uh, sometimes it takes outrage. In this case, there's a lot of outrage. But um, more than anything, to make sure that the systems that already exist are, are being utilized to their extent. And I do not think reclaimed water is being used to its extent here in Tampa. Um, I, I, would, I would say that there's not a lot of people in Tampa probably have this weird dynamic of knowledge that I have on irrigation and uh, from the ag side and residential side and grew up here and is familiar with all of this. So um, I, I, there's a workshop coming up uh, tomorrow, actually, that I plan on attending uh, to, tr to try to work with them and hopefully provide some solutions to them. But, uh, you know, I, I think displacing reclaimed water is, is going to help us big time. Yeah, well, and you do. You're right. You have a very unique perspective that uh, m most people don't have. Yeah. And so we, we talk about toilet to tap. We know um, you said at the beginning, uh, Vegas does toilet to tap, correct? Um, recycled. <laughs> I'm doing my marketing pitch right now. <laughs> Definitely recycled water. Yes. Okay. So recycled. So um, they basically mix all their wastewater, treat it equally, I guess. And then you can do whatever you want with it is the idea. Yeah. Um, and, well, and they pump it back uh, into Lake Mead. Oh, into Lake Mead. Okay. And yeah. then they pull it from it when they need it. Right. So they, um, they do a commercial filtration, but then they have natural filtration uh, through uh, an aquifer that uh, take, takes it to uh, Lake Mead. Okay. So uh, similar to ours, except instead of a lake, it's a river. And it's a river that opens and closes basically all the time. So um, while there is a reservoir, we call it the Upper Hillsborough River Reservoir, while we do store water up there, it is, um, it, it is being released into the estuary as well, which... Uh, is I guess similar to Lake Mead. Lake Mead overflows, or is the Hoover Dam on Lake Mead? Hoover Dam is on Lake Powell. Lake Powell, okay. So um, I assume there's ways to raise and lower water levels in, in Lake Mead if they wanted to. Yeah, definitely. Okay, yeah, so um, so that's basically what we're doing here. Uh, so the uh, 
the way that we treat the water to be able to drink is, is uh, not overly complex. We either do it with a series of membranes and filters um, for, the, for the larger bits and pieces, and then it comes down to some form of a chemical balance. And uh, some of the apprehension from the public is the chemical balance, the chemicals that we introduce into the water and the rates that we're doing it. Because the, the speed in which we need to take wastewater and make it drinkable or make it usable in any other form is very, very large. And as we know with desal plants, um, there is a lack of efficiency to them. When you're running water um, through an RO system or through very high pressure membranes, it does take time. And that's why the desal plant, uh, I think when we got our tour, uh, it, it, the water, it, this isn't a, an immediate process. There's a treating of the water that slows it down. And that, that treatment costs money. Every second that goes by running all those machines costs money, requires infrastructure. So there are ways to do it, but we don't have three or four billion dollars to invest into uh, filtration that doesn't require some form of chemical treatment. So in the meantime, the short term answer is to introduce chemicals into it, whether or not it be chlorine, fluorine um, or anything else. Uh, and there are tests that are constantly being done and sent off to a third party to make sure that they're accurate. Uh, in the bottom left here, you can see that I, I mentioned some of these tests that happen. Uh, there are considerable amounts of tests going on. Part of the new peer program is actually additional testing and more testing, uh, or more testing and more precise testing. So, um, so we'll learn more about the water uh, in this process as well, which obviously goes into the cost of infrastructure. Yeah, and Michael, I, I stand corrected. You were correct. Lake, uh, Lake Mead does have Hoover Dam and Glen Canyon Dam is on uh, Lake Powell. So I, you had that right. Okay, yeah. So they open and close it when they need water. Um, and so we obviously have some resilience. We actually do get drought, just like Texas. You know, it does rain a lot, but we do get drought because when you have this expectation for water and rain so often, um, you know, drought comes very quickly uh, when you don't, don't have a resource you're used to. So, uh, so we do have some resiliency issues. Uh, this leads to the low river flow, which creates um, very bad things for our river. We get red tide. It doesn't really go too far up into our river, but the way we're able to fight red tide from coming too far up the river is to keep those river flows pushing it out um, and keeping it past the bay. So if you slow that down, obviously the tides is going to bring in um, bad things that are going to affect the estuary. So uh, we want to make sure that uh, we don't let the river get too low. Right now, we're very reliant on sulfur springs uh, for some of our water table. Um, and like we said, we're going to have some issues with that soon. So that's more of a natural issue. The displacement of the wastewater is um, not necessarily a government issue. They, they are mandating it, but it's a step in the right direction. It's a, it, it is a process that needs to be refined. And hopefully the state will throw us uh, some money when it comes time to, uh, to do whatever we decide to do. Um, some additional solutions. So uh, we have an area called Armature Works. And at, at before the call, we mentioned other cities across the country, uh, like Columbus, like Austin, um, even Denver has a little river running through it. Um, you know, a lot of tourism um, is based around rivers and a lot of cities are facing the same thing. I know the river in Columbus uh, is not very clean as well. The Ohio River in, in it is not the cleanest river or the Mississippi. So um, a lot of our a lot of our rivers have issues, and we could do a, a whole um, whole another webinar on the Mississippi and how we cooked it, you know, with co corn subsidies and whatnot. But uh, some of the problems with our toxicity levels in Tampa are just the lack of introduction of good clean water, good fresh water. Well, the irony is we have public spr or private springs all along the river. In this photo right here. Um, this is my friend's neighbor that lives on the river. That's clean water that's coming out of a spring in his backyard um, that goes into basically a glorified French drain. And this is how much water comes out of the pipe. It's running upriver. I know the infrastructure is not there. It's just leading into the backyard. I've never seen healthier oak trees. Um, but the water flowing out up at the source about 60 yards up towards the back of the house is a nuisance to this, this, um, this homeowner because he, the water is bubbling out of there constantly. He can't get rid of it and he doesn't want to have to spend the money to move that water properly from where it's at to the river. Well, uh, at, at the head, we have this area of development called Armature Works that's reliant on the river now for its restaurants and its river walk. Well, they opened up an old spring there. And in doing so, you have all this crystal clear water that's being introduced to the river. And they put rocks down to make sure that it doesn't backflow. Um, and now there's fish, there's manatees, there's dolphins, there's all this new wildlife coming up there because it, it immediately lowers toxicity, toxicity levels, even if it's at a, um, at a precision level where it's just right there. 
if you have these springs going all the way up the river and people aren't utilizing the water, uh, just like we joked about the 50 gallon barrels in Utah trapping water, this seems like an easy subsidy or easy rebate to allow these people to open up these springs um, and, and at no cost of their own to maximize that resource before we start worrying about any of these other solutions. This seems like something there, it's already a burden to a lot of homeowners because they don't know what to do with this water. Um, you know, why not streamline this process uh, and kill two birds with one stone and so many. So this isn't unique to just this one resident. There's other residents no. that have these springs popping up. Yeah, um, I mean, this, this used to be all cattle land. So a lot of them had wells on them that were pulling from the aquifers below. And they either abandon them or some of these are springs that have just made their way up. Um, I mean, throughout Tampa, there's little parks with a little fountain and it doesn't look like clean water. Um, a lot of the nicer, like, but it's constantly being fed water and then there's an overflow. Um, and so when you, when we did a litter cleanup along the river, there's, there's pipes and you'll just see water draining out of them. You're like, what is all that water? It's not, it hasn't rained. It's coming out of the sewers. Well, a lot of those springs, they just drain into the sewers and then it comes out into the river. So um, naturally this, this is already happening, but um, I'm already aware, I know about half a dozen springs that reside, if not in people's backyards, in public land that is just kind of where uh, mangroves and stuff are growing and they're just not routed properly because the lack of infrastructure. Uh, I think this would be an easy program and something very nice to market by the city to, to try to free it up, not to mention the homeowner now has nice clean water going to the river behind him. I've seen manatees when I'm fishing here come up and drink right out of that pipe. Huh. So um, they're looking, they like that clean water, they know where to go. Um, and you can only imagine if these existed every uh, quarter mile up the river, it's a 60 mile river. So um, there's, there's some springs along it that could be introduced to it. Yeah, oh, that's interesting. So not everybody pi pipes the spring water back to the river because there's a cost associated with that. This is not even piped. This is just a three inch line that when they were excavating the backyard to put the um, that um, deck in the background, dock in the background, uh, they just dropped it in the ground. It's not to grade properly. Uh, I know uh, you can wash your hands in the spring um, at the top of the property and uh, it's gushing. I would say five to 10 gallons per minute. Yeah. I mean, and this is just kind of trickling out of this. So, you know, the pipes, uh, going up and then going down and then it's just bleeding it's probably not glued together or anything done so the infrastructure could be improved upon i mean i've wanted to do it just as a charity project to prove my point but um capturing a well like that it, it's an abandoned well there's cement block up there where something um like a an old pump was on it that was broken off and so now it's just dumping water so you'd have to like go back there with the backhoe dig it up pipe it in um kind of like an oil like something you get something you get oil out of uh, and build the infrastructure. But the amount of water, five to 10 gallons per minute pumping into uh, into the river right there, multiplied by 50 to 100, you clean up the river. This river back in the, the 50s, um, they used to have raft races um, down it because it was so clean. And if you remember, uh, I did that art show about 20 years ago where I pulled the old skateboards out of the river and I tried to hire a diver and they laughed at me and they said, you need a full hazmat suit to jump in that water. Wow. And um, a couple of Super Bowls and Stanley Cups, and now people are excited. They go swimming in it, but that water is not any cleaner than it's been for years. And uh, the only thing we can do to fight it is try to introduce some clean water to it. And this one just seems like an easy solution. Uh, some of the more um, complex solutions I listed uh, as well, uh, like we said, treating the iron, um, you know, the introduction of nutrients to irrigation systems in California is used all the time. I mean, if you're a big HOA, fertigation is just, you're, it's a must. You, it's too hard to distribute that much fertilizer. The personnel doesn't exist to treat miles and miles of hedges. And so the only way to truly treat properties that large is through fertigation. Well, the technology has come a long way. And I think if we could package this um, and sell it or give deals on water softeners, I know that sounds crazy, but somehow pass this um, along to the residents that can afford to treat it instead of just taxing everybody across the board. Um, you know, maybe that's just kind of getting the, these are low hanging fruit, not end all silver bullets. Uh, but I think if the city, you know, collectively was aware that we had a water crisis, like we do, uh, I know I would focus on it more. I would, you know, um, I use drip irrigation, uh, but I already have, you know, tankless water heaters, things like that. Um, and so just, uh, these are but, some short-term solutions. Yeah, that's a great point, right? It's going to take um, it's going to take a lot of different solutions to add up to to a great solution, and all those are great recommendations. 
And as we know with tier pricing, um, I know we're tight on time, but with tier pricing and water, you know, um, uh, what happens is when people fill their pools up here, and I have friends that own pool cleaning businesses, um, I'd actually have to talk to them about the science of reclaimed water in a pool and then treating it. I would think when you put a bunch of chlorine tablets in it, to some extent, it would clean the water. Um, but, you know, that throws people a couple times a year into another tier, if not the top tier, uh, where your water goes from $60 a month to $400 a month. Um, and so, you know, maybe instead of ch charging those people that much more to fill their pool, there could be some form of a program uh, where when you're trying to fill your fill your pool, a, a truck shows up, dumps a bunch of water in it, two or three trucks. Uh, you know, I would think that at 300 bucks for a water bill, uh, maybe there's something there and, and advantageous for our cause. Right, right. Like you say, uh, another solution. Um, and lastly, I wanted to end it. Uh, like I said, a lot of cities are promoting tourism around their waterways. Uh, we have a beautiful river walk that extends uh, up the, the best part of the river, which is down um, through downtown. It connects our where our, our hockey team plays all the way to a, a kind of a collective of restaurants and whatnot. Um, this was not here when I moved away 12 years ago. Uh, it's come a long way. They're definitely using it. The, the speed in which this city is growing, uh, I think, is inherent to the outside and outdoor areas that are being created, the river walks. Um, we're not right now creating too many new parks in this city, but what we are doing is we're uh, maximizing or capitalizing on our waterway. And I think it's really just a shame to do that and not focus on uh, some of the challenges we have with that water that looks so great, but can smell so bad. And so I included a couple of photos here along the river walk, kind of showing how um, it, it's, it's centralized around, around our downtown. Yeah, it looks beautiful. I'm wondering when you're going to invite me out. Um, yeah, well, uh, not in August, um, <laughs> but in uh, in the spring and um, and uh, after Thanksgiving, it's beautiful here. Uh, it's we're in the process of connecting a lot of these. Uh, we have a mobility program here in Tampa, so we're in the process over the next five to ten years of connecting. Kind of like Minnesota has their whole bike path underground. Um, we're going to have this big six to eight mile loop that's going to loop all around the city of Tampa. Um, with very little safety issues. And so uh, we suspect half a million new people are going to be moving to this state in the next five to 10 years. And so they're going to need something to do. Um, and this, this, it all kind of stems around water. And I think a lot of what we do stems around water. And so I don't think this was too far out of right field uh, for this audience. Yeah, and no, I love it. Really uh, taking advantage of uh, the natural beauty, the natural resources there, get people outside, get them exercising, talking to each other. What a, what a great, um, a great draw for Tampa. That's for sure. Right. And so, um, you know, as I said at the top of the hour, um, I, I will not admit I'm no, no water scientist, but what I, what I do know a lot about is the distribution of water and, you know, how to filter water and the efficiencies of water. Um, and so hopefully this, uh, this plays into what we talked about today and more of a knowledge base for people to understand that there are crises out there uh, beyond uh, lack of rain and, um, you know, other, other items that we get used to. Yeah. Well, great job, Michael. Uh, thank you so much for presenting this. Um, just want to confirm if anybody has additional questions or wants some help talking about this, they can reach out to you uh, at uh, this email address or uh, that is your Twitter. And uh, is that your Instagram uh, handle also? Uh, no, I do the Jane's USA uh, Instagram, so anybody can uh, can touch base with us on there. We try to you know try to keep it as a database of knowledge and education, so uh, not too much product promotion. We try to keep the content uh, pretty solid, and so you can always check up with us there or DM us if you have any questions. Yeah, well, excellent job. Thank you again, and thank you to all our viewers today. And we know how busy everybody is these days, and the fact that you'll spend a little bit of your day with us, we really appreciate. We are bringing uh, good, good irrigation knowledge uh, and water knowledge and sustainability knowledge to all of you. Remember, you can view all our trainings at janesusa.com forward slash trainings or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. You know, we extract the audio out of this. We put it on uh, podcasts and uh, it really uh, gets me excited to think people are out working and learning at the same time. What a great combination. Uh, again, uh, Michael, thanks very much. Uh, really enjoyed the presentation. Uh, learned a lot today. And, uh, and like you said, this isn't just an issue for Tampa. This is going to be something uh, every uh, city in America is going to have to deal with. So thank you. Thanks.